Um, so hello everyone once again. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, discussion entitled Poland's Road to European Union Membership Lessons Learned as a part of the Western Balkans program within the framework of the Warsaw Security Forum. My name is Bartomi Kot and um, today we are hosting another distinguished guest, Mr. Włodzimierz Cimoszewicz. Mr. Cimoszewicz was the Prime Minister of Poland from 1996 to 1997. Over the years, he held many uh, other high-ranking positions in the Polish government. He was a member of parliament for over 16 years, the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General, the Chair of the Constitutional Committee of the National Assembly, that, which drafted the Constitution of Poland, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Speaker of Sejm, which is the lower chamber of the Polish parliament, and an independent senator for seven years. Mr. Cimoszewicz was uh, the one who signed uh, the accession treaty that paved way to uh, Polish membership in the European Union. And currently he is the member of the European Parliament. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. My pleasure to host you here today. Um, before we jump into discussion, allow me please to briefly explain to our participants the plan for today's uh, panel. Uh, first, we will listen to the uh, to an introductory speech of our guests, and later on, we'll jump straight into taking questions from the audience. I promise you that today it is totally your open opportunity to discuss uh, with our guests. So please be active and engage. And once again, um, to repeat you the rules, uh, please use, use the chat box for this purpose. Type in your questions uh, as they come to your minds, and I will allow them just after the introductory speech of our guests. So, Mr. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will take probably uh, 20, 20 plus uh, minutes, so we will have a lot of time to ask uh, any questions you would like to. Um, in our case, everything started, began in 1989, so 31 years ago. That was a moment in our modern history when uh, we had uh, unprecedented uh, uh, talks, negotiations between the government and the solidarity opposition. And uh, in the fact uh, of so-called roundtable uh, negotiations, we got early parliamentary elections. And despite the fact that uh, they were not 100% uh, free and democratic, they still created the opportunity for the people to express their preferences, political preferences. And the, in that symbolical sense, the, the, the results of the, of the elections uh, were evident. Solidarity uh, got uh, very, very strong support. So uh, three months later, uh, we had the first so-called non-communist government in the country of Prime Minister Mazowiecki. From the very beginning, uh, the government uh, declared uh, our uh, desire uh, to reshape our foreign relations in that sense that we wanted to join the democratic West, democratic Western Europe, but still having Big Brother uh, existing uh, on the Eastern border, I mean, Soviet Union. Uh, but in that particular moment, we declared to continue to be a, a member of the Warsaw Pact and so on. That was about securing our really uh, deep fundamental political and economic domestic reforms. So in next year, 1990, uh, we applied for association with uh, uh, the predecessor of the European Union, uh, the European uh, Economic Commonwealth. Uh, it happened uh, in 1991, we signed uh, an agreement which came into force three years later in 1994. Now, I mention all of those dates because I would like you to see and understand how long was uh, uh, the way uh, from the very beginning to, to, the, to the end, uh, uh, which was the full-fledged membership of the European Union. So from 94, uh, we, had, we were an associated country uh, this is the status uh, that uh, some of your countries are applying for. Um, and um, that offered us uh, some opportunities not existing before. Uh, the common market uh, was to be open to us uh, step by step. 
uh, we got some time to prepare our economy and our uh, our uh, industries, our firms uh, uh, to exist and to look for success at much more competitive market in the future. Uh, and that was also a kind of training. That was a kind of uh, school or, or, or almost kindergarten uh, before uh, real thinking about uh, uh, full membership to, uh, to the union. I have to say that at the very beginning, in the first half of the 90s, our, our, uh, the way we thought about future membership to the uh, EC, European Union, was uh, a little bit naive. Uh, it seemed to us that that was mostly a political uh, problem to be solved by political decisions taken by the 15 member states uh, in that time. Uh, it took some time uh, for us uh, to understand that, uh, yes, of course, there must be a political will, but uh, before a final decision, the candidate, the applicant country must fulfill a lot of uh, conditions. And um, step by step, uh, uh, participating in various forms of pre-accession uh, activity, we uh, built our, uh, let's say, understanding of what was to be done, really uh, what was to be done. In 94, uh, we um, officially applied for, for the membership. Uh, and um, that uh, initiated the process of uh, preparing by the European Commission an assessment of, of Poland as a country applying for applicant status, candidate status. In 96, the uh, Commission presented so-called AVI, a kind of opinion about uh, candidate countries. In that time, that was, uh, among the others, uh, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, uh, yeah, at, at the very beginning, there, there were three of us. Uh, uh, in 96, as uh, Bart mentioned, I, I was appointed uh, prime minister, and I understood uh, that uh, uh, unfortunately, we have wasted uh, uh, some time. We, we, we have had wasted some time. Uh, and um, that uh, we needed a kind of special push. Uh, we needed uh, a stronger motivation for all of the members of the government, of local governments, uh, business, etc. And I decided to create so-called Committee for European Integration within the government. Uh, I became the chair of it. And we created also a special office, uh, uh, office of the European integration uh, serving the, the committee. Uh, in the office, we employed, we hired there mostly uh, young, uh, but very well educated people who were uh, uh, very flexible since uh, they had no experience and uh, they easily adopted to new procedures, new way of acting. Uh, it allowed us uh, to achieve some effects uh, much, much faster than if we use traditional bureaucratic way uh, of, of making them. Uh, so just a couple of months later, uh, there was already what we called a strategy of European integration of Poland. So a very broad and detailed uh, document uh, precising what should be done, what we had to do in the country, uh, everybody, government, local authorities, business, uh, uh, people, just people, ordinary people, in the education sector, etc. That was accepted by the parliament uh, at the beginning of 97. Uh, and uh, in the same year, 97, we got excellent uh, opinion by the committee, European Co Commission, by the European Commission. So next year, Already in time of the next government by Mr. Jerzy Buzek, uh, we began negotiations. Then it took us four years uh, to negotiate the, uh, the, the accession treaty, the, the, the content of the accession treaty. And in 2002, in December, in Copenhagen, together with nine other uh, candidate countries, uh, we came to the conclusion with the, uh, with the old member states. Uh, in 2003, uh, I had the pleasure and honor to sign together with the Prime Minister of that time, Mr. Miller, the Accession Treaty. And on the 1st of May next year, 2004, 
uh, we became uh, the uh, the member of the uh, of the European Union. Uh, let me also remember that after signing the accession treaty, we had a European and European referendum in Poland. Since it was politically decided earlier that the whole nation has to take uh, the decision. Why we uh, uh, believed that that was necessary in our, in our case? Because uh, after initial period of time when uh, that uh, target uh, to join European Union was very broadly supported by the vast majority of the people, then some reservations and suspicions uh, arose. Uh, we had uh, one of the uh, big, uh, let's say, sector, part of uh, the population, our peasants, uh, very, very Eurosceptical. They, that was uh, that was uh, irrational, but uh, in that time they were very very much afraid of uh, competition from uh, highly developed Western countries, from Denmark, from Netherlands, uh, from France, uh, etc. Uh, that was irrational because uh, uh, it was just opposite. Uh, joining the European Union opened uh, fantastic opportunities for our food producers. So today, Poland. Uh, uh, exports uh, uh, agricultural products for approximately 30 billion euro a year, which is more than uh, Russian exports of arms. And this is done by Polish farmers nowadays. Uh, they are this group uh, uh, which uh, got the highest profits uh, uh, in time of our EU membership. But uh, before, before uh, earlier, that was quite different. So. Since in that time we had two million uh, private farms uh, in Poland, that was a big problem, also a political problem. And then we had quite Euro skeptical church, Catholic Church of Poland. So, uh, that skepticism of the church in Poland was to much extent balanced by the very fortunate fact that in that time we had a Polish Pope, John Paul II, who was pro-European and um, who moderated the position of the church in the country. But still, we had to work with, uh, uh, with the church. Uh, we had to inform them, etc. So as foreign minister, I attended uh, the meeting of conference of episcopates, of the gathering call of the bishops, uh, archbishops, and so on, just to inform them uh, about uh, uh, what what were our plans and what were our goals? We organized trips of bishops to, to Brussels uh, to meet uh, high top functionaries of the European uh, institutions to talk with them and so on. And all that worked because for the first time in history, we got referendum with binding results. Our constitution requires high uh, turnout, 50%. Otherwise, the results are not uh, legally binding. In, in this case, uh, we had, I believe, 57% participation and uh, well over 70% uh, in favor. So it uh, gave a very strong political mandate and support for the treaty and for the membership. It is exceptionally important. Uh, and I must say, from the peasant perspective, when we have a ruling party which is very Eurosceptical, uh, it is, uh, it, it was really, we were really very wise uh, almost 20 years ago to decide to have a referendum because nowadays it is politically extremely difficult to take a reverse course, to move back. Um, uh, and we continue to have a very high level of, of support by the people. What was the most important in all that process? First, uh, the fact that at the very beginning, we defined a clear target, a clear goal. We declared to, uh, we, we wanted to join uh, Western Europe institutions. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we declared that we wanted to join also uh, NATO. And that was broadly supported, as I said, especially in case of NATO. Almost 100 percent of the of the people supported that for, from the very beginning. And those two goals, those targets, uh, went together uh, hand in hand. Uh, uh, that was a logical uh, interdependence of these uh, uh, two uh, ideas of these two projects. So uh, uh, that was also a very, uh, a very positive uh, synergy uh, situation of uh, having uh, that kind of two projects. What was important was the fact that uh, with that mentioned earlier 
uh, Euroscepticism shared by some people and institutions in the country, the vast majority consequently move in the moved in the same direction. So with the changes of the governments and par parliaments, uh, we didn't have, uh, we didn't change uh, those basic goals for our foreign policy. That was continuation from government to government. Uh, and uh, that, that was really very, very important uh, that those issues for a very, very long time uh, didn't become a ball in a political uh, play as usual. So that was respected. Uh, I remember that when we negotiated, uh, when we finalized negotiations, that was the most difficult part of negotiations, of course, because everything that was difficult to be solved was left for for later uh, period of time. So as foreign minister uh, in October 2001, I inherited uh, uh, a very poor, uh, very unfortunate situation. Suddenly, uh, from the position of the leader, we became the worst negotiating candidate among 10. Uh, and uh, I understood from the very beginning that we had to change uh, the strategy of our negotiations. And I proposed to the government, to the new government, to change, to take decisions on, on changing our strategy. We had to uh, redefine uh, our uh, goals uh, related to some specific issues, like purchase of land for foreigners. Uh, 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 the European Union citizens from other in member states, etc. And uh, the government supported my proposals, but the opposition reacted in the time very emotionally. And a month after I was appointed the foreign minister, there was a non-confidence motion against me in the parliament. Uh, as I mentioned, that was 2001. That was the tragic year of 9-11. As a result of 9-11, the, the, the session, annual session of the General Assembly of the United Nations was postponed from traditional September until November. So I had to go to New York to attend that uh, uh, session. And uh, that was probably the only case of that kind that uh, uh, being absent, I had a debate in the parliament and voting over my, uh, over my saying in, in my office, in my position. Fortunately, I, I won the, the, the voting. It is almost an anecdotic situation because exactly in that moment in time when they were voting in Polish parliament, uh, confidence or non-confidence to me, uh, I had a working lunch with some experts in political science in New York, including famous Francis Fukuyama. And uh, uh, during the lunch, I received a small piece of paper with the result of vote. So I told my guests that they missed uh, exceptional opportunity to start the lunch with foreign minister and to end it with former foreign minister, because uh, I, I had to continue my, uh, uh, my let's say my position, my tasks, etc. All right, uh, uh, so uh, uh, we finally got it, but I have to say that, of course, it required a lot of preparations, uh, uh, domestic preparations. So, for instance, in the parliament, we decided to uh, have a special committee on inter European integration, but not just, you know, uh, to have it. We equipped it with very, very special power. Every piece of legis legislation related to the European ones was sent to that committee and nobody else. Usually, usually the uh, drafts uh, of bills uh, are being opinioned by, by, very often by more than one committee. Not in this case. And it didn't matter what was the substance of the bill. If that was related to our uh, uh, to preparing our legislation uh, to, to the uh, conditions of membership that went to that committee. And it allowed us to accelerate uh, the whole legislation process. In years 19, 1998, uh, 2001, we adopted well over 500 bills, which wouldn't be possible with that specific uh, uh, institutional and procedural uh, change and solution. So that was very important. Then 
as I told you, we had referendum and to win it, uh, we needed uh, to inform, inform the people in detail. So we launched two year long campaign, information campaign and promotion, of course. And fortunately in that time, uh, we had also not only the Euro skeptics, but also Euro enthusiasts, especially among young people. So we had a lot of NGOs very active in this area. And um, for instance, today uh, there is uh, Natalia Vizitska, uh, my assistant, parliamentary assistant with us. Uh, in, in that time, she was one of those who created European clubs in her high school. And we had thousands of that kind of uh, initiatives. Uh, at the level of, of schools, universities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we had a lot of a lot of thousands of partners of re representing uh, civil society, uh, and uh, those people helped us to spread information, to deeper uh, deepen understanding of the integration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, today, uh, with uh, sixteen year long uh, experience, I can say that. Uh, it's been a great success. It's been a great success. With all of the problems Poland faced, for Poland, like for instance, Hungary faces today. With all of the problems uh, being faced by people in countries like Bulgaria, in a sense, in Romania, in Czech Republic, etc. Uh, we, we know that the present reality is not ideal, that there are some uh, threats, risks, challenges, problems, etc. But uh, and, uh, without neglecting that, uh, uh, treating all of the, those um, negative, I would also dare to say pathological developments, uh, political developments in some of our countries, I would say that general balance uh, of the uh, effects of, uh, of membership is just great in any sense. Economic sense, our economy has been doing much better uh, financial sense, of course. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I traveled to Western Europe for the first time in my life when I was, when I was 25. Uh, and uh, I visited, among the others, Spain uh, with my car. In that time, uh, and I still remember that, the uh, roads in Spain were very poor quality, not better than in Poland. Uh, then I went there 20 years later, uh, when uh, Spain already had been um, EU member for 15 years, and I found completely different reality. Today in Poland, it is absolutely the same. We, we, have, we share the same experience. 16 years after joining, the infrastructure of Poland looks totally different than it used to be uh, six, 16, 20 years ago. If you go not just to big cities, but if you go to the smallest villages, uh, you see uh, you, you can see the change. And if you didn't visit Poland before, you can see that everything looks fine, just fine. You have uh, thousands of uh, evidence uh, that people are uh, are living better, just better. They can afford renovating, building. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You, you see how uh, entrepreneurial is Poland, how many local small firms are everywhere around. Uh, you go to this small village and you have uh, three grocery stores, uh, uh, two, three services, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in that sense, it, it works uh, perfectly well, I would say. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, our position as, uh, as an investment uh, site uh, uh, became stronger and more attractive, of course, uh, also for the investors uh, from the outside of the European, European Union. Everybody who is in this club is uh, more re reliable. I wonder if you have heard that just a couple of days ago, Commission, <clears throat> uh, for the first time in history, offered, um, offered bonds, European bonds. And the offer, they, they wanted to sell, I think, uh, bonds for 17 billion euro. The demand was for 233 billion. So it was uh, 15 times higher than the offer. What does it mean? That uh, uh, investors all around the world trust European Union. So it is not just uh, the, the case of the United States and the dollar that it is being trusted by uh, by many, if not by everybody all around the world. European Union 
is trusted. So European Union member states are trusted as uh, as uh, investment de destination. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 I, I, I personally believe that uh, what is among the most important effects, this is broadening of the rights and freedoms of the people and uh, opening, let's say, the way to new way of living. Uh, uh, we have millions of people living nowadays in other member states, working there legally, uh, having social, social security, uh, healthcare se se security, etc., etc. We have tens of thousands of, uh, 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 of uh, folks in your age uh, studying uh, at the universities uh, all around Europe, etc., uh, etc. Et so it is very important. Life became much easier, much more comfortable. You know, uh, it happened once that uh, I was invited uh, to attend the conference in Dubrovnik. Uh, and um, uh, since I'm living uh, 250 kilometers away from Warsaw, I had to drive my car to the airport. Uh, and just entering Warsaw, I suddenly realized that I didn't take my passport with me because I didn't need it going to any other European country. So I had to move back for 200 kilometers to take my passport. Uh, all that was uh, a little bit funny because then I was informed that uh, they didn't uh, expect uh, me to have a passport. Any ID was, uh, was enough, uh, was sufficient, uh, but I didn't know that. Uh, so uh, I can continue that, but uh, I, I want to respect my declaration by the length of my in, uh, introductory statement. I just want to say that in any sense uh, related to the position of the country, but also to the conditions of living of the individuals, uh, we are in a different reality. We are in a different uh, uh, world. And the last remark uh, is about uh, what we have not achieved or what we have missed, uh, but just on our own, uh, let's say, uh, choice. So this is the international position of Poland. Uh, for quite many years, Poland used to be respected uh, a partner in international relations, also in within the Union. I, I remember 2004, Orange Revolution uh, in uh, Ukraine. My personal initiative together with German Foreign Minister Joska Fischer to involve in, uh, uh, European Union into uh, looking for the solution, peaceful so political solution of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, then uh, 2014, six years ago, one of my successors, Sikorsky, Radek Sikorsky, going together with German and French Foreign Minister, Ministers to the same Kiev, Ukraine, having where there was the an, another second Maidan helping to look for some solution, etc. Poland was respected. Nowadays, with uh, the present government, I, I don't want now to, uh, uh, to make you, let's say, uh, uh, to become involved in our domestic uh, conflicts and uh, discussions, but I just want to say that, that with the present po foreign policy and with all of the problems we have, we face uh, nowadays, Poland, uh, Poland's international position has become much, much weaker, uncomparably weaker. But that is our own fault, and uh, nobody can be and should be blamed uh, for that. I say that just uh, not to present to you a kind of pink picture. Uh, the reality is not um, always uh, just nice. There are real important achievements, and uh, there are areas where we have not used the take the uh, when when where you we. we Sorry, but we have, haven't taken the opportunity. Yeah. So uh, this is something to, to be discussed about. All right, so I think that I can stop now. And um, as I said, I'm open for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for, for your speech. Well, I remember the great ambience and this nationwide engagement uh, around the referendum. And at that time, we had certain priorities that you mentioned that weren't contested by the governments when they changed. And actually, those who contest them, uh, meaning the agricultural industry, they, they have actually profited the most, I guess, uh, uh, when it comes to our membership in the union. 
Um, having said that, I can see that there is question coming from the audience. Uh, so let me please take uh, take the questions from the audience, and uh, I will read you out your name. Please unmute yourself, uh, say your name and affiliation, where do you come from, the state, that is important, and uh, ask the, the question directly to Mr. Prime Minister. And I encourage the others to type in the questions, think about them as they come to your mind. So uh, please, Marietta, if you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello, uh, my name is Marietta. I'm uh, coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cimosevic, if I pronounced well <laughs> your Excellent. name, family name. Um, thank you very much for uh, sharing your experience with us. And I really hope that uh, you gave us also some interesting ideas that we could implement here already uh, in Western Balkans. So my question uh, is uh, related to the costs of the, of the EU membership uh, for Poland. Uh, so I wonder, are there any costs and potential costs uh, for the future, because especially taking into account the new uh, changes in the EU climate policy and how this will uh, reflect on, the, on Poland and their politics? Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, it depends on uh, what you believe uh, is uh, necessary to be done and uh, how to arrange that. Uh, if you are one of those, like me, who believes that the climate is changing and the, to much extent is the result of the human activity, uh, uh, there is uh, no doubt that we should, uh, uh, we should uh, change our behavior. And uh, that uh, at least we have to reduce significantly uh, the emission of carbon dioxide. Uh, so we uh, should replace uh, fossils uh, with uh, uh, with some um, other sources of energy, uh, especially uh, uh, solar energy, wind energy, etc. I personally believe uh, that uh, it can be done in a way now declared by the European Commission. That means that we can build new industries and we can uh, try to achieve global goals related to climate uh, uh, with economic success. We can combine that. We can combine that. Uh, that idea has been shared by many. So, for instance, when uh, Barack Obama as president launched some pro-climate uh, uh, decisions in the States, he also encouraged to develop some uh, industries, ecological industries, uh, uh, look for China. They are, of course, nowadays the greatest polluter, but but with a very um, unwise decision by Mr. Trump to withdraw from Paris Agreement, uh, Chinese uh, leader Xi Jinping decided to to replace United States as the leader, global leader, in one of the major uh, issues. Uh, and um, they have recently declared. Uh, 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 the, the goal for China to become emission neutral in 2060, which is uh, something almost unbelievable. But they are already doing that. They are, for instance, the biggest producer of solar cells in the world. Uh, they have uh, the highest production of electric energy from solar uh, uh, panels. Uh, so um, I think that uh, we should uh, look at that uh, in a broader sense, in a broader perspective. One more uh, argument. Uh, uh, we estimate that in Poland, just due to, due to the pollution of air, approximately 40,000 people die a year, earlier than they would, if uh, we have not that uh, the kind of pollution. So uh, this is also about lives, many lives of people here, but also in neighboring countries. Uh, uh, and finally, of course, there is a problem with coal mines. But let me tell you that when I was prime minister, we were closing coal mines uh, without major difficulties in local with local people, because we offered alternatives. So, in the in the same moment in time, 
when my government decided about closing uh, some coal mines, we created special economic zones, attracting investors. And in Upper Silesia, which is the center of our coal mining sector, we created the first Gliwice special economic zone, where today we have dozens of, dozens of thousands of jobs created by investors. So it is possible to be arranged relatively peacefully. Yes. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, actually, Gliwice is right now the, the center of Polish automotive uh, industry with uh, Opel, with, uh, with Fiat uh, ha having the, the factories there. That's worth mentioning as well. Uh, Dusan, uh, there is a question from you, from you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, first, thank you for your introduction. It was quite, quite helpful to um, hear about Poland's uh, examples. I heard you mention some interesting facts that I think can help uh, my country, but also other Western Balkans countries in their EU accession road. That's, uh, that was my question. So you mentioned office for EU accession and strategy for EU accession that your government um, has implemented. And my government has the same uh, um, uh, policies implemented. We have a ministry entirely devoted to EU, EU integration, but what you have mentioned, what I believe we don't have, or I've never heard of it, and what I think can be very beneficial is the parliamentary committee for the EU accession. So my question was to you, um, can you share more of the, of the committee that you mentioned? What were its um, powers? What, what were its uh, main duties? What was the experience? How did it help? Because I really believe that it could help uh, my country. I come from Serbia, I didn't say that. Um, yeah, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. Um, I th really think it could help uh, my country, but also other Western Balkan countries to have more of the parliament um, involved in the, the process of um, EU accession. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, in a way, I will answer your question, but uh, I, I want to make uh, a little bit more general uh, remark uh, that, uh, yes, it is about uh, some institutional solutions and procedural solutions. That's exactly. But as I said at the very beginning, the, the, the clear goal, the right definition of your major target is probably the most important. And, um, uh, you know, uh, let me also tell you that in 2003, I attended Thessaloniki summit of the European Union when we, uh, where we went and where we did, adopted a declaration on Western Balkans future And uh, at least from that moment, uh, it is something very much uh, important also for me to uh, make it uh, a little bit easier for all of you and to encourage you to join the European Union. In case of your wonderful country, Serbia, uh, I have no, that, let's say, 100% uh, uh, certainty that, uh, uh, that uh, that goal is clear. For, for the government, uh, for many people in Serbia. When I follow uh, the relations between Serbia and Russia, Serbia and China, uh, I wonder if Serbia is equally in interested uh, as a country in uh, strengthening uh, developing relations with uh, European Union. Because Serbia, in, that's my opinion, of course, I, I, I can be wrong, uh, that is possible, of course. But I'm afraid that uh, Serbia is being uh, used instrumentally by those countries, by those two countries that are not very much interested in success of the European Union. For Russia, it would be much uh, easier to make foreign policy uh, dealing with separate individual countries, European countries, than with uh, Brussels institutions. For China, it would be also great to have some places in Europe when they can become very active uh, economically uh, to have uh, an open entrance to the European Union without reciproci reciprocating uh, the, uh, for instance, trade conditions with the European Union countries. All right. So this is the most important. Uh, if, if you do not have that kind of uh, um, uh, target, uh, uh, clear target, supported by the majority of the political forces of the people, uh, then you, you may have any institutions, any procedures, but there will be no result. 
as I told uh, earlier, uh, I created a so-called Committee for Rape Integration. That was a uh, body responsible for coordination of the activities of all of the ministers, uh, whole government. You know, this is just a piece of real, of real life. Uh, if you are Minister of Education, if you are Minister of uh, Industry, of Agriculture, of anything, you are responsible for some specific targets in your sector in a visible perspe pers time perspective. Uh, let's say, uh, until next elections uh, or in next five years. And you care mostly about that. And when, uh, even if you know that uh, your country wants to join the European Union, so that uh, requires some additional activities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. From your own individual perspective, this is a second-class duty. This is not the most urgent problem issue. So I decided to create that committee. I decided to chair it just to push everybody. And uh, of course, when Prime Minister is personally really involved in the project, none of the minister will dare to oppose it and not to, to do what uh, he or she is asked uh, uh, to do. And uh, a little bit similar situation was with that special committee uh, responsible for European integration within the parliament. Again, in this case, it was very important to have a right person as a chair. And that was Mr. Bronisław Geremek. Bronisław Geremek was a very famous Polish politician, very well, uh, very much respected all around the world, uh, of course, in Europe. Uh, uh, at the end of his political career, he was also uh, the member of the European Parliament. Unfortunately, uh, uh, he died tragically in a car accident driving from Warsaw to Brussels uh, several years ago. Uh, but he was very strong personality and uh, uh, he was very, let's say, influential. Making him the chair of this uh, committee and equipping the chair formally with very strong powers uh, allowed us to move like, you know, to, do, to move the whole mechanism like a tank, like a heavy tank, which uh, was able uh, to cross uh, uh, any barrier uh, to destroy any uh, any uh, limit, go beyond any limits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again, personality, real in engagement, strong competencies, exceptional, which shouldn't be continued after achieving the goal, because in fact, they contradict the uh, traditional standard democratic procedures in the parliament. But sometimes it is absolutely necessary to focus your attention, your efforts, and best people on that uh, particular target. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, just to underline it to, to our friends, uh, let me tell you that actually Mr. Geremek was from the other side of the political spectrum at that time than Mr. Cimosiewicz. So this is uh, also a clear example how uh, how clear the, the goal of um, of uh, joining the European Union was for the for all the major major political parties in Poland at that time. Uh, that there was a consensus on that probably um, uh, unimaginable right now in Polish parliament. Um, okay, uh, so another question from uh, Vesna. Vesna, please un unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for this uh, inspiring uh, uh, moment that you shared with us. And it's also very encouraging, not for uh, the countries only, but also for the people, because um, for me, it's highly touching the way that you have approached even your own impeachment. Uh, so thank you for, for spending um, time with us and sharing um, moments that are beyond the topic, but very important. I would like to ask you if you had the chance to speak from this perspective, what have you, what would you done differently on the manner of uh, Pol Polish uh, integration toward the European Union? That's the one question. The second question is uh, related for the church issues. For me, it was a bit uh, surprising because usually the European Union and institutions are keeping to uh, secularity and neutrality. But this also might be a helpful uh, experience for the Western Balkan countries where church is uh, pretty strong, has strong influence over the citizens. And uh, usually the biggest opponents, at least in, in my country, I'm coming from, from North Macedonia, 
uh, a church is the, usually the anti-European uh, structure, or at least some parts of the of the religious communities are in this line. So it might be useful. And I have another issue that arises in the meanwhile, because you mentioned Glivoitz or something, as if I pronounce it well. Glivice, Glivice. Glivice. That was a former um, energetic uh, power plant or something? Or how no, is it? No, no, this, this is a city in a region in a province called Upper Silesia. Upper Silesia is an industrial uh, region uh, with uh, traditional, very strong coal mining sector. So yeah. most of the uh, black coal mines, uh, uh, mines are locate, located there. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, my question was actually, uh, because we have similar issues here, the coal mining at least in North Macedonia, are used for electric power plant. And the country is very dependent on non-ecological resources in order to produce electricity. So my question was basically related to that issue with Poland. Uh, was there energetic transition? How to say from one type of energetic sources to another? Or how is it uh, currently solved? If you could just uh, uh, comment something uh, on that, if there was a change before and after the European Union from environmental and energy sector perspective. Thank you. OK. So church and energy, uh, spiritual energy and real energy, and electric energy. Uh, this is important. If, if, if a church is influential institution, if there are many, if a high percentage of the people are truly believers, uh, true, true, true believers, it is necessary, necessary to work with church. I'm not a believer. I am, uh, let's say, atheist. Uh, and I had no problems, of course, uh, to deal with uh, church care arcs, uh, to talk with them about European integration and uh, about the reasons. Uh, so I tried to explain to them uh, uh, why that was very important for Poland as a country, why that was very important uh, from the point of view of the living conditions of our population, of our people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that, that is not an easy uh, task, but uh, if you do it, friendly, not aggressively, if you do not press too strong, if you encourage, if you inform, uh, then if you, uh, uh, if you convince both people in Brussels and in local church uh, to meet, to talk, to learn, to study, to get in, to become info better informed, uh, that is the way. Uh, and it should not be ignored. It should not be neglected. Uh, uh, then uh, that uh, transformation, energy transformation, that is, of course, not an easy. I don't want to say that it is peanuts. Yes, it is uh, quite difficult. It is, uh, uh, it will be costly. But uh, I believe you have heard that uh, uh, in this days, in this month, European Union is going to finalize the pr procedure of adopting new seven year uh, uh, long uh, financial perspective and the fund of, uh, let's say, reconstruction, uh, the new generation. Uh, and uh, it was decided that at least 30% of that giant fund, 750 billion euro, should be spent for ecological purposes. So uh, if Poland, uh, like other countries, uh, is ready to absorb that money with, with some sense, that uh, that is going to be quite uh, important uh, assistance. In our case, the problem is that we are the only member state uh, that has not declared uh, the emission neutrality uh, in 2015. This government is very skeptical about that. The present government in my country, so they did not. They did. They didn't do that. And there are some suggestions nowadays in European institutions that in case of such countries, only half of their share, financial share for, for to, to, to be spent on those purposes should be really offered in practice until they make that kind of declaration. Uh, so we are talking about uh, dozens of billion of euros uh, that can flow to Poland and help uh, assist us uh, in making the transfer. Then the second, uh, uh, the second issue, the second um, uh, condition is not to block the local and private initiatives. Again, the present ruling majority adopted some years ago 
very uh, uh, demanding legislation related to the construction of windmills. Uh, it was uh, five times easier to, to make them, to build them earlier before that new legislation came to force. Today, you cannot build a single windmill in a distance shorter than one and a half kilometer from any house. It's quite difficult to find such places uh, in a populated country. Uh, it, and it doesn't have much sense. Uh, before that uh, legislation was adopted, we've got a lot of private investment, Polish and foreign, in that sector, in building windmills, because we are a relatively well-located country. We have mountains in the south and then we have plains, so we have a lot of wind. So uh, nowadays it is absolutely important that they change this legislation and make it much more liberal. Of course, with res all respect for the local people, fears, and so on. So I also wouldn't like to have a big windmill 100 meters away from my house, but I don't care if that was built 300 meters from my house, which will uh, make it much, much easier uh, to, to, to be uh, constructed than it, is, uh, uh, than it is today. And finally, as I said before, uh, if you replace uh, uh, those traditional uh, resources and traditional energy plants with new ones, you also can create new jobs, new industries, new uh, sectors, etc. Can you imagine how many people can uh, get new jobs in firms installing solar panels? We, we can have hundreds of such uh, firms, local firms, uh, offering dozens of thousands of jobs for, for the people, uh, etc., etc. So uh, all that can be combined uh, uh, in a rational way, lowering the socially felt costs. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Prime, Prime Minister. Uh, as we're running out of time, I'll take one more question. Mm -hmm. And uh, please uh, make it short. Katarina, your turn. Thank you, Bart. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister, for uh, for your for sharing your insightful experience. Um, I would like to get you back a bit to the entire accession process of Poland, and uh, I want to ask you: What do you suggest is of utmost priority for the Western Balkan countries to be immediately undertaken as a reform, which will bring the countries closer to the EU? And the second one, I will skip because we don't, we're out of time. I wanted yeah. to ask you about the the current situation in Poland with the adopted law on abortion, which is moving away from the uh, European course that Poland basically took and committed to. And even though it's a domestic issue, it's still, we look at, Pol at, at Poland as someone to look up to now in this example. So if you don't have time, it's fine. Just for the first one, for me, it's more important. Thanks. What country are you what from? Uh, uh, North Macedonia. Ah, North Macedonia. Uh, it's a pity that we have no time because, uh, you know, I, I was in Macedonia in that time called Macedonia 11 years ago, trying to convince your leaders that they should be a little bit more flexible uh, when it came to the question of the official name uh, uh, to, 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 to close the chapter of disputes with Greece. Uh, uh, the, the second uh, issue, uh, that was not uh, a new law, new legislation. That was the decision by the Const Constitutional Tribunal, which found the existing regulations unconstitutional. As one of those who wrote Polish constitution, I totally disagree with the Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, I, I strongly believe that they are absolutely wrong and that the, the, the decision was taken uh, in a way making it invalid. But that is for another uh, uh, discussion. Uh, then uh, uh, when it comes to, to all your countries and your, um, uh, and your way to the, to the, European, uh, to the European Union, to make it uh, in the most brief way as I can. First, you have to believe, to be sure that it is a historical significance goal. I believe that joining European Union was one of the most important events in 1,000 year long history of my country. 
this is exceptionally important. It is uh, a kind of uh, guarantee of uh, being a part of very valuable civilization, European civilization. The world is changing. It has changed in last 25 years fundamentally. We've got a new superpower, we've got new powers, and uh, this is not just about economy, this is also about the way of living, ideologies, values, etc., etc. European countries are too small, all of them, including Germany, to survive the new epoch, new era in history of the, of the world. We have to unite, we have to be together. And that is understanding that historical dimension for all of us, those who still are outside the Union, those who are in the Union, but partially not believe in the value of that, and those who strongly believe in value of being part of the Union is the most important. Then it is, of course, very important to inform inf people, to talk to the people, to, uh, uh, to educate people about what I have said just now and about what is the European Union. Because uh, we, we have to understand that there is a lot of ignorance about that. There is a lot of ignorance. Uh, and it uh, just uh, depends on who is spreading rumors. Uh, uh, you have e either idealistic vision of the Union or you have uh, uh, very critical, full of suspicions, etc., etc. So such uh, basic uh, things are very important. And then this is the ability to prioritize your goals and uh, to be able to compare the value of your goals with the value of some reservations, like in case of North Macedonia. I, I believe that you have wasted at least 10 years just because of the question of the name of your country. That, that has been senseless. That's my opinion, senseless. You know, 10 years in history of people is a lot. It, it is a lot. It is one fifth of the adult of the ad, adult part of living, of life. So, um, uh, and then when you finally start, when you start uh, talks, talking, negotiating, be very consistent and go in this direction. Don't be suspicious. Brussels doesn't want to make any tricks, to cheat you, etc. But Brussels is responsible for defending, preserving our solutions, European solutions, our values, etc., etc. And this is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we run out of time, and I unfortunately have to stop you right here and now. Mr. Prime Minister, that was a pleasure. I believe our young leaders found your remarks enriching and are able right now to recognize that the struggle of becoming the member state um, doesn't actually end at the moment of accession, I believe, but it is our daily duty to rise up to the values that uh, we as Europeans share together. It was enormous, uh, an enormous pleasure to see you all virtually today and uh, we see each other in the next webinar. So have yourself a short 30 minutes break. Thank you. Thank again. you. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.